the case of Dungeons and Dragons, these kids are indeed in jeopardy. And if they're just role playing, uh, they can't be. It seems to me that when we first started playing with the concept initially, they were role playing and at the end of the episode, why they'd go back to being who they were. And we thought, yeah, that's not gonna work. Because if they're not in real jeopardy, and if the audience doesn't believe they're in real jeopardy, then why care? In September 1983, CBS debuted a hotly anticipated new animated adventure series based on the world's most popular role-playing game. The series featured six youthful protagonists who had been trapped in a magical realm. Given mystical weapons and powers, Hank became Ranger, young Bobby became a barbarian, Presto became a magician, Sheila became a thief, Spoiled Eric became a cavalier, and Diana became an acrobat. For three seasons, Dungeons and Dragons ruled Saturday mornings as the young heroes fought against Venger and the multi-headed dragon Tiamat. In the next half hour, the origins and secrets of Dungeons and Dragons will be revealed from the producers, writers, and artists who created the fan favorite series. Roll the dice now to experience the thrill, fantasy, and excitement as you begin entering the realm of Dungeons and Dragons. I was the director of children's programming at the CBS Entertainment Division, which was part of the network. We're the guys that, in, in children's programs, we developed as well as honchoed the show. And so I was in with the development of Dungeons and Dragons. And our, our initial concern with the show, other than getting the characters right, was getting the, uh, the concept right. We had to have the audience believe that the kids, the characters, were really in a tight spot. And you couldn't do this if they were just role playing. But with Dungeons and Dragons, we had a great team. Judy Price was tough as nails and Judy and I worked very well together. Uh, she had a good sense of what she thought would work. I had a sense of what I thought would work. Hank Saroyan uh, was terrific. Mark Evanier really helped us in terms of character. Uh, and uh, Bob Richardson and the folks at uh, Marvel were terrific because you know, we all wanted a hit. I first became involved with Dungeons and Dragons uh, probably about a year and a half before the show went on the air when I was about to leave Hanna-Barbera Productions and uh, got a call from Judy Price, said, you want to go work at Marvel? And I had been the executive in charge of Marvel's shows, Pink Panther and Spider-Woman, when I was at ABC with Judy. So I said, no, I don't want to go there particularly. And she said, well, you need to go there. And so uh, by hook or by crook, I became um, vice president of network current programming and network development, which lasted about five years. The first show we did was Dungeons and Dragons. And I met Bob Richardson. And Bob and I are both dedicated filmmakers and relatively not ready to give our faith to anybody else unless they earn it. So the first few months were kind of interesting. CBS really uh, realized at the onset that the game as it, exactly as it was would not make a perfect show. Uh, you have to sort of distill certain ideas out of that game element because it's one kind of medium and bring it into series development so that it works as a series and as uh, an entertainment vehicle. Uh, and 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 also it's a process of elimination you have so many characters in the game that don't necessarily combine well to make a really great show i was writing the pilot for a another cartoon show for abc one one year and uh, i get this call suddenly from a fellow named dennis marks who was i do for marvel productions he says we want you to write the pilot for dungeons and dragons i said i'm too busy i can't i'm sorry i'm doing this other script so then I got a call a half hour later from a man named Lee Gunther, who ran Marvel Productions at the time. And he said, we need you to write this pilot. If we don't sell this show, the studio has to close. And I thought, well, just a little bit of pressure there. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm still, I'm too busy. I, I'm, I'm sorry you're, you're going to go out of business. I've got to write this other script. And then I got a call from Judy Price at CBS. And she said, I, I want to pick up Dungeons and Dragons as a series, but I can't until I have a workable pilot script and a workable Bible. And we don't have it yet. And we will postpone the announcing the fall schedule 
to wait for you to get tired to write a script. And I said, how much would you postpone it? She said, well, maybe a day or two. I finished it on Tuesday morning. I started on Dungeons and Dragons Tuesday afternoon, wrote the Bible Tuesday night, wrote the pilot script on Wednesday, and CBS bought the show on Thursday. When I was handed the Dungeons and Dragons show to write the, the Bible and the pilot, the show had been through about 11 writers at that point. A fellow named Dennis Marks had basically conceptualized the show, but other people had taken a crack at it. And what frequently happens with these shows is that the more writers you have, the more they add things, no one takes away. So the show had about 33 characters in it. And it was too cluttered and it was too complicated. And I just came in and threw out half the cast or more than half the cast. And then tried to work out specific uh, relationships between the different characters so that you always knew what, you know, how, how Hank related to, to Venger, how Venger related to Bobby, and how Bobby related to the unicorn. And so they, they all had some sort of attitude towards each other. And uh, it, it, my job was kind of to simplify the show, and then later as other writers and people like Hank Saroyan and, and Jeffrey Scott got involved and Michael Reeves, they fleshed out what I started with and they built it into the show it became. I seem to recall that was Mark and Bob and myself sitting in a room going, how do we get them there in such a way that it's something any kid could possibly do? So there's a universal believability of how they got there. Uh, and then we thought that that was kind of a good idea, a cross between Space Mountain and uh, a roller coaster, where they go into that dark place first, and then they end up, oh my god, what's happening? And uh, it seemed to work. We felt like, you know, if we took them into a, a ride that's almost like a game in a sense. The dungeon, no escape. And something happens in there, and suddenly they're now in this foreign area that they don't know how to get out of and they're trapped. And essentially, that becomes the, the working mode of the show, is them being trapped and trying to get home. And, uh, and we felt like kids could understand, you know, being trapped a, a, away from home in this kind of bizarre land, and there's evil characters there and so on. Uh, and that would make a tremendous uh, dramatic kind of presentation. We also had the unique thing, which was very unheard of in Saturday morning at the time, to have a quest that never is reached. It's never solved. They had Pyrrhic victories, if you will, in every episode where they'd win and they'd get away with it and they're not getting killed and the unicorn hasn't been eaten and the horn's not cut off, but they're still stuck here. And uh, it was kind of risky to try that, but it sort of made the show more interesting because any one of the characters at any time could be just unbearably frustrated that they can't get out of here, which gave us a lot of humor from Presto and a lot of humor from Eric. And Hank was always the stalwart one. I mean, Hank was the one that was straight and narrow, and then everybody else was sort of built around him. It just sort of evolved into, into the way it was. It had really nothing to do with the game, except that they were in this world trying to solve problems to get out. They had clues, they had thoughts, they had strange things happen that they had to decipher. So we started with the pilot uh, that uh, Mark Evanier did, which is high quality generally. I mean, Mark is just a screw around guy. And I had just come from Hanna-Barbera where my story editor on Trollkins with Joe Barbera was Jeff Scott, who I had come to like at ABC when he story edited Super Friends. And I figured the one thing we needed on this show to give it a fighting chance was the writing to be done efficiently. And Jeff was and remains the most efficient writer I know. He can take on a series and do the whole series uh, in one fell swoop, which is what we used him for in the first season of this and the first season of Muppet Babies. I uh, was not able to stay with Dungeons and Dragons because I was at the time writing uh, a variety show for Dick Clark's company. I was writing, I was story editing Richie Rich for ABC, and I was writing about 11 comic books at the time, and I just couldn't fit everything. I would have liked to stay with Dungeons and Dragons, but it was, it was actually more fun to just watch it afterwards, to hand it off to other people. The writing staff over the various seasons um, was more diverse than most of the shows I work on. I like to find one guy that really gets it and rely on him substantially. And, uh, but this show just wouldn't allow that. The shows were too complex. We also had uh, a, a very talented uh, art director named Takashi who was involved with the development of a lot of the artwork. Uh, um, basically, I supervised what he did, uh, and I also had another very talented artist named George Good, since passed away, uh, actually quite a few years back. 
Uh, and between those two guys, they were key people in terms of developing the look of the show. The question, uh, and it's come up before, about uh, why Venger only has one horn. And the reason is directly related to the art director that I worked with, and he, and this is, his name was Takashi, very talented guy, and he wanted Venger to only have one horn. I mean, it, it, he felt like two horns was very uh, cliche, and so we gave him one horn. And in spite of the fact that in animation you try to make characters kind of equal on both sides in case you have to flop them or whatever and it's a little easier for animators we thought you know what that's a cool idea and we don't see Venger that much in the show so fine we'll make Venger with one horn Fools, enough I will deal with them myself When we were casting the voices, Hank Saroyan had some very definite ideas about who should be who. And quite frankly, his instincts were terrific. The one thing that's missing when you start a new show is there's no reason to hook into the characters. And I thought, what if we get some voices that are known but not known? You know, we don't brag about who they are, we just let them be there. And uh, the first person I thought of, I think, was Willie Ames, who was a friend of mine. And uh, Donnie Most had been the only actor, in my opinion, on the Fonz and the Happy Days Gang series on ABC that really understood or at least inherently possessed the kind of energy that animation required. So those were the first two guys I went after. And then I was telling Willie what we were doing, and he said, oh, you got to audition Adam. So then Adam came along, and then after that, we just started to listen to regular actors that were Saturday morning actors because they didn't want too many people that were novice to this art form. Greetings, young pupils. Hello, Teddy. How'd he know my name? Dungeon Master knows all kinds of things. Huh. Everything except the way home. On the contrary, Cavalier. A portal to your homeworld lies within those mountains. Oh, yeah? What's the catch this time? Before you leave, you must destroy it. And if we destroy it, it can't get us home, right? Sheesh. How would we find it in the first place? Sidney Miller was like a gift. He just walked in one day and was Dungeon Master. I don't think there was a lot of question about it. Um, matter of fact, he helped us make Dungeon Master more benign than he might have been. He became much more of a Yoda character talking in parables and things that uh, were much more interesting. One of the rules of casting a cartoon show in the 80s was that you do auditions and you audition everybody in town before you hire Frank Welker to do a voice. I think Frank was on every single show, one or two seasons, doing sometimes speaking voices, sometimes like on Dungeons and Dragons, animal sounds. Uh, Frank's real voice is pretty much the voice of Fred on the Scooby-Doo show, which he's been doing since the Paleolithic era. But he is this incredible talent who can sound like anything or anyone. He can sound like monsters or little helium-voiced creatures. And when Hank and I had our first lunch to discuss how the show would be cast, he had all these ideas, and I just said, OK, for the unicorn, just, just hire a welter. Don't waste your time. Peter Cullen had been a friend, and I knew he could handle Venger. Although, it's interesting, Venger had so much screaming and so much loud, oppressive stuff, shouting, uh, that Peter and I began to try to judiciously schedule his time so that he wouldn't be in there acting with the other actors quite as much because if he had to do retakes because someone else screwed up, it was really taxing on his throat. I have the wizard's hat. Hand over the rest of your objects of power. We wanted a certain kind of reality. So the youngest voice that was played by Teddy Fields, which is the character Bobby, we wanted a kid that sounded like a kid, like a real kid. You, you, otherwise, you have an, uh, an older actor doing a kid's voice, and many times that works really well in a sort of broader comedy, cartoonier type of show. But in a realistic kind of show like this, we wanted a young kid like that to really sound like a young kid and have the kind of uh, speech that a young kid brings to that type of performance. It's tough sometimes because a kid like that doesn't have the experience 
to move rapidly through scripts like, you know, seasoned actors. But still, we got a performance at, at the end of the line. We get a performance out of them that sounds like a kid, which is what we really wanted. Unbeknownst to me, my son, who actually had uh, joined a buddy in a cattle call uh, for an audition uh, at one of the uh, at one of the studios, and had been called in because they weren't happy with anybody else, and they'd heard his voice, and uh, he was a, a kind of a pretty good actor, uh, at least as an eight-year-old. And when we were listening to the voices, I obviously know my what my son sounds like, so I took myself out of the judging and Judy and some others, Judy Price, the Vice President of Children's Programming, and Hank, and uh, I think Bob Richardson listened to the voices, and the voices were numbered, so nobody knew who was going for who, and they selected my son. Uh, and I had to sign some kind of special dispensation that said that I had nothing to do with it, and I did have nothing to do with it. And funny thing is, I remember after the first recording session and here my my kid is called he's like eight or nine years old he's called out of school to you know he gets to go over there and of course he thinks it's fun and games because there's food and pop and he's out of school and the voice director uh, Hank Saroyan called me that afternoon he said you gotta have a long talk with Teddy he thinks he's, he's in recess he said, I've got all these very highly paid professional actors and he's uh, putzing around so that night, I had a very long talk with Theodore, who incidentally played Bobby the Barbarian. Uh, by the way, he's a dentist now. And I said, Teddy, it isn't fun in games. Well, after a while, he became one take Teddy. He did that show, and then he went on to uh, be Mr. T's sidekick on NBC for three years. So he became a pretty good uh, voice actor. Dungeons and Dragons was a show that was based on the famous TSR um, role-playing game. And I had a number of friends who were working on it, uh, Mark Evanier and, and several others. And they had said to me, this is the kind of show you're perfect for. I was specializing in action adventure. So I had talked with Mark about this, I believe it was Mark, and we had discussed a couple of uh, ideas. And one that I particularly liked was about a character called Dekion, because to me, I had been kind of frustrated at that point not being able to do the kind of uh, rich character stories that I was seeing done in Japan and elsewhere, where the characters would have histories, where they would not be perfect. They would have flaws and have to overcome those flaws. And Dekion is actually a very tragic figure in a way. He, he is trying to regain his former self and he has to make a decision in the story is is my quest to return to what I once was does that justify behaving in, a, in an unethical and immoral manner in order to get what I want I really like that about it I really like being able to tackle that kind of a philosophical problem Dekion was a character who was called the living dead character and this was a term that bothered some of the people in, in CBS's program and practices. It implied zombie or vampire or living dead. Well, that's what the living dead is. And they were very much troubled by this. They didn't want to have any occult black magic or evil satanic things involved in the show. And we're going like, guys, come on. Dungeons and Dragons. I mean, that's what the whole franchise is. Any, any kid who turns it on already knows what Dungeons and Dragons is all about. They're going to expect to see this. So we had a lot of back and forth as to exactly what he could look like, what his, his, um, his story was, what happened to him. And basically, they tried to sanitize it as much as possible. But we still basically came down to this. We have a character who's been turned into a skeleton and the question is, what will he do to get turned back into a normal person? Uh, finally, they, they accepted that and let us do it. And I, I'd like to think it was one of the better episodes that we did. Uh-oh. Help! Help! 
looks like the old Cavalier is in trouble. Can't, can't we discuss this over lunch? Hey, guys, why fight over pennies when you can have all this? As far as the chronology of the shows go, the first season was pretty much us all figuring out what the heck this world looked like, who was in it, what the breadth and depth of the, of the domain was what kinds of villains they could have. And then the challenge with any series by the time you get to the second season is how do we top that? We liked our characters. We couldn't really change them much. They were working. We liked the stories. We didn't want to change them much, but we started to make them slightly a little more complicated, a little bit more danger, a little bit more intrigue. Uh, and I think that worked, which then carried on into season three. I got involved with Dungeons and Dragons through Carl Gears, who had been, among other things, one of the uh, producers on Black Star. And he invited me in to talk about it. This was during the second season of the show. And he knew my work from Black Star, and he had convinced CBS that I might be a good writer for the show. I wound up writing seven episodes of the show over the course of seasons two and three. Carl and I just got along really well. We both had the same sort of ideas about stories. We liked the possibility of pushing the envelope as much as we could. We were aided in that to a great degree by the people at the network. We had a couple of people there who were willing to try and take the stories a little bit further than the usual Saturday morning kind of dried uh, pabulum. One of the episodes, uh, The Dragon's Graveyard, is I think considered by most of the fans to be a fairly seminal episode. Certainly one of my favorites. It was one of my favorite scripts for a long time. The kids actually did something about their uh, predicament. They were acting. They weren't just passive and running around until Venger tried to get the weapons from him, they actually decided to take the fight to Venger, which was kind of unheard of at the time. Dungeons and Dragons was a very exciting project to work on for a lot of reasons. One was that it was one of my favorite kind of subject matter, and the other was that the producer was a close friend, Carl Gears, and we worked very closely on a number of episodes uh, I remember storyboarding several in collaboration with him, and it was great fun. It was an exciting show that was done with really interesting uh, group of regulars. I also got to design a number of uh, monsters and other things, locations. I did some background keys for a number of episodes, so it was it felt like a small-scale collaborative effort, the two of us working together on that, and it was really fun. Dungeons and Dragons was already in production into its second season when I was over at Marvel working on the Spider-Man series and his amazing friends. And I got a chance, Bob Klein was doing storyboards, and they needed somebody to help out doing corrections and changes to bring the shows within a lot of time. There was only 22 minutes, sometimes the war could be a little longer, sometimes a little shorter, and maybe corrections as far as certain things that the director wanted. So I got a chance to help out on that when possible. On Dungeons and Dragons, I got a chance to look at some great storyboards by Bob Klein, one of my storyboard heroes, and really see some fantastic storytelling, which helped me improve my storytelling. And to see the shows follow his boards precisely to what he had made me want to improve on my work as well. I've been collecting his boards and looking at his boards as reference, even as today, I still look at Bob Klein boards as reference. Yeah! Come on, hurry! It's kind of an urban legend that the Dungeons and Dragons show embraced uh, satanic or evil morals, or even that it was canceled because of that. I, I meet people who think the show was yanked off the air because of protest groups. The show was yanked off the air because the ratings were declining, which is the reason most shows are yanked off the air. Years later, people seem to have believed that the protests were a part of it or that somehow there were hidden messages in the show. When I was there, the hidden message in the show was buy these toys, buy, eat, eat, these, eat these sugared cereals. Uh, and they weren't very well hidden. Uh, we just did a, try to do an adventure show. We were trying to push the envelope a lot on monsters and fire and sword play. And that was, uh, to the extent there was any controversy, there were people who I think thought the show was a little too action-filled. Contrary to what you may have heard, uh, I don't think that broadcast standards or the religious right or any uh, 
political influence had anything to do with the show getting canceled except the ratings started to drop and CBS was looking for ratings because they were battling with ABC and NBC for top slot. It's all about making money. They ain't making money, it isn't on the air. And I get emails twice or three times a week from people who ask me uh, either was there a last episode of Dungeons and Dragons where the kids got home safely or telling me they remember vividly seeing this episode, they're sure that there was one, and where do they get a copy of it? And the answer is, you know, this DVD is complete. It's everything that was ever done on Dungeons and Dragons. There was no last episode. At the end of the third season, CBS decided they would do something which was fairly unique at the time. Uh, they wanted to do a closer for the third season that would work either as a ending to the series as a whole or a way to spin it off in a different direction if they decided to go for a fourth season. So they hired me to write the episode. We called it Requiem. And it basically did just that. We set up a new direction for the show to go. And if, if they were going to pick it up, if not, then we had a coda for, for the uh, series as an end. I'm not quite sure why it uh, wasn't produced. Do you always have to do that? No, not always. Huh? I have found a possible way for you to get home, but it is very dangerous. What isn't dangerous around here? Go on, Dungeon Master. Far to the east. The fans for Dungeons & Dragons, it's amazing. The, um, the show is, I get letters on it every day. It's remarkable. Um, particularly since I posted on my website the script for the, um, the last episode, which I was hired to write, and which never got produced. <laughs> it's, it's really amazing. Um, I constantly get mail from people who tell me that they read the script and now they've achieved a, a sort of closure with the show and they can sort of move on with their lives. I mean, it's very touching. It's fascinating to me that uh, Dungeons and Dragons, the cartoon that I helped develop along with Judy Price and Hank Zeroyan and Mark Ebenier and Bob Richardson, uh, it's still got legs. Although when I think about it, we work very, very hard on each of those stories. Actually, I'm not surprised. It's great that it's lived this long, but I'm not surprised when I think about all the effort that went into making it. As far as the, the new DVD attention to, uh, to this series, uh, it actually delighted me. I had no idea this was happening. And uh, one of the things about Judy and Bob and me and Jeff Scott is that when we worked, we worked hardcore the whole time, 17 hours a day, seven days a week, trying to get this to be as perfect as possible. For what this was, I think it was as good a show as could possibly be done at the time. I always think it's wonderful if you do something 25 years ago and the audience today can appreciate, even with the differences in style and various things that happen over the years, if they can still appreciate what you did, then you did something right with the audience. And, and ultimately that's what it's all about, is making a show that the audience can appreciate. I'm really surprised that the fans have been that loyal to the series these years. You know, it hasn't been out in syndication, it hasn't been out on video, but the fans still remember the show and still love it, which to me is just great. They enjoyed it enough to keep it going. And I'm glad that this box set of DVDs and we get a chance to relive those shows again. I've worked on shows that even I didn't remember, but Dungeons and Dragons seems to have struck a chord with people. Uh, the writing on that show was very sharp. I don't mean mine necessarily, but the later, the later episodes, there were some very good people on it. They really cared about doing a, a show that would stand out, and I think they accomplished it. I think it's very nice that they're finally putting Dungeons and Dragons out on DVD, and we can all throw away those crummy bootlegs we bought. My oldest son, uh, Dr. Ted uh, is very excited about the fact that Dungeons and Dragons uh, will be on DVD because uh, he wants to show it to his two little girls, one of whom right now is two and a half and the other is eight months old. And uh, I'm sure he'll have it running in his dental office. Uh, but I know that uh, he had asked me a couple of times if, if anyone could find a DVD. Well, now they can. Thank you all for your help. You're welcome. Come on, guys. We've still got to find a way home. So long. Here we go again. Farewell. 
Unbeknownst to us, Willie had gotten cast in a soap opera that shot in New York. And it was all every day. He was there every day. There was no way he could do this part anymore. And I refused to have him replaced. And one year, we decided what we would do is have Willie record the lines with a phone patch. I would send him the script, we'd talk about it for about 20 minutes, and then he'd go through all the lines for Hank. Not the whole episode, just his lines. And on one particular occasion, I recall he had to be somewhere else for another interview in Chicago or something, so he was at Grand Central Station. And the only time we could get the studio required that he call me from a phone booth in Grand Central Station with the script in his hand and read the lines over the phone while I'm directing him in the phone. And I would say, no, I don't like that reading. This is a bigger, a bigger thing. Look out! You know, Eric, look out! And we're doing it, we're like two thirds of the way through the thing and we start hearing this banging. We didn't know what this banging was. I said, Willie, what is that? It's gonna screw up the animation guys. They, can't, they don't know what that is. And he says, excuse me a minute, it's a woman outside. And he says, I'm on the phone. And she says, I wanna use the phone. And he shut the door, starts doing it again. And uh, uh, she starts banging on the door again. And finally he opens the door and he says, damn it lady, I'm trying to do a television show. What's wrong with you? And he shut the door. And he said, the woman stood out there. He was going ahead with the thing, and he looked over, and he said, I can't believe I just said that to this woman. You should see the look on her face. And she's like leaning down, looking for lights, looking for cameras, whatever. It was just hysterical. He was in there for like half an hour. The portal lies within the maze of darkness. To find it, you must first become lost. And remember, Sometimes, by looking back, you can see a clearer path through what lies ahead. Oh, brother, here he goes again. Remember, in darkness, look to the light. But remember, the fate of one is shared by all. Beware, you must never touch the beauty that breathes the beast. However, when the dragon's heart is in the right place, it may show you the way home. Its power is in the giving, not the keeping. When you need its protection most, you must give it away. You will find your way, or rather, your way will find you. But remember, in shadow there lies great danger and great rewards. Hey, wait a minute. What did you do with my magic shield? On this journey, knowledge will be your shield. Let's see. What would Dungeon Master say? You will find it? Unless it finds you first, it lies a long way off, yet in truth, it is very near. How is that? Boo!